Epstein anomaly is a congenital heart disease marked by the apical displacement of the septal and posterior tricuspid valve leaflets and a degree of displacement of the anterior leaflet, leading to atrialization of the right ventricle. Great, that's very beautiful. What does it mean? <laughs> okay, so the tricuspid valve that communicates the right atrium to the right ventricle is meant to prevent backflow of blood from the right ventricle to the right atrium when the right ventricle contracts. Clearly denoted by the name, the tricuspid valve is made by three leaflets, tricuspid, three leaflets or cuspids. During embryology, the valves originate from ventricular tissue, and in the process of separating from the ventricular tissue, there is a process of splitting of tissue named delamination, or detaching the tissue's inner lamina or layer. If there is a failure of delamination, two of the leaflets may remain adhered to the myocardium, namely the septal and the posterior leaflet. Since these leaflets cannot separate adequately from the ventricular myocardium, they will tend to remain very close to it and thus not move upwards, causing the tricuspid annulus to be epically displaced. Epically displaced means only that it would be displaced towards the apex of the heart, that is, the pointy end of the ventricles that's pointing down, as opposed to the base where we have the great vessels emerging from. The tricuspid annulus is the boundary between the leaflets and the surrounding perivascular tissue, meaning that the tricuspid valve, particularly the septal and posterior leaflets, will be lower than it should be, causing the boundary between the right atrium and the right ventricle to be lower than it should be, meaning the right atrium will have a larger volume than it should and the right ventricle will be smaller than it should. However, that's talking about the chamber volumes, because regarding the wall, the myocardium, it will be pretty normal, which means that if the volume of the atrial chamber will be larger, but the myocardium is the same, we will end up having a portion of wall that physiologically corresponds to the right ventricle, but is actually surrounding the right atrial chamber. This is called the atrialized portion of the right ventricle, that is, a portion that physiologically belongs to the right ventricle, but that due to a displacement of the boundary between the chambers is now anatomically part of the right atrium. Even though the epically displaced tricuspid valve is the cornerstone of Epstein anomaly, however, it's also marked by other findings, such as fibrotic cardiomyopathy of the right ventricle. The right ventricle is likely to have some degree of impairment with its function additionally to what would be expected from the valve, and it's often, in more than 80% of cases, associated with atrial septal defects. The reason we focus primarily on the tricuspid valve is because Epstein anomaly has a huge variation in anatomy and severity between patients. Histologically, it's a cardiomyopathy of the right ventricle, and since the tricuspid valve develops from the right ventricle, we present with the displaced tricuspid valve. Which brings us to the major complications. Tricuspid regurgitation, right heart failure, and arrhythmias. Because the tricuspid leaflets are malformed and displaced, it's unlikely they represent a perfect seal when closing, meaning that, more than likely, some degree of blood will flow through the tricuspid valve into the right atrium backwards when the right ventricle contracts. Tricuspid regurgitation, which may be anything from mild to extremely severe. This is made worse by the atrialized portion of the right ventricle 
which is surrounding the right atrium, but will contract along with the rest of the right ventricle, meaning that during the ventricular systole, it will also contract around the atrium, further pushing blood upwards and upstream, in the opposite direction it should normally flow. All this blood backflowing from the right ventricle to the right atrium is likely to severe volume overload the right atrium, causing it to massively dilate and also eventually overload the right ventricle, since it has to push the blood twice, first into the right atrium and then forwards as it should be from the first time. Eventually, it may lead to right heart failure. And finally, the tremendous stretching of the atrial wall from this massive dilation may damage the conduction system of the heart and is likely to predispose to arrhythmias. A very large degree of patients will present with at least an atrial fibrillation. However, more severe conditions such as Wolf Parkinson White are not uncommon. In most patients, having an atrial septal defect will not lead to cyanosis, at least not until Eisenmenger syndrome developed. However, Epstein anomaly is considered a congenital cyanotic heart disease. That's because, in this condition, the backflow of blood into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve due to tricuspid insufficiency is likely to increase the pressure of the right atrium. Some of the ventricular pressure during systole is backflowing and spilling over to the right atrium. This will cause the right atrium to have higher pressures than normal and, most important, higher pressures than the left atrium, meaning that, through the atrial septal defect, blood will flow from the right deoxygenated systemic blood to the left oxygenated blood. Mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood will occur in the left atrium and the blood being pumped to the systemic circulation will be a mixture of arterial and venous blood, which may present a cyanosis if the oxygen saturation becomes low enough. So the reason Epstein anomaly is cyanotic is because the tricuspid regurgitation causes the right atrial pressure to become elevated and blood to flow through the atrial septal defect in the opposite direction it would normally. Epstein anomaly is also strongly associated with pulmonary stenosis and somewhat associated with congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries, or level TJ. Like pretty much all congenital heart diseases, it's suspected multifactorial, and in its specific case, it's more frequent among white people, and there may be some association with maternal ingestion of substances in the first trimester of pregnancy, especially lithium and benzodiazepines. Notwithstanding the extremely non-association with lithium, most cases are actually sporadic. Its incidence is about 1 to 2 per 10,000 live births, but it's likely underdiagnosed since the milder forms are sometimes not noticed. Prognosis is hard to ascertain because of the wide variety of severity. As a general rule, age at presentation is the best prognostic factor. The earlier the age at presentation, the more severe the disease likely is, and thus the worse the prognosis and the higher the mortality. A child presenting with cyanosis may be unlikely to reach 50 years of age. However, a 40-year-old patient presenting with arrhythmias has a decent chance of surviving for another 10 years. Speaking of which, the presentation will vary based on the patient's age. Younger patients tend to suffer from the hemodynamic effects of the anatomic changes, whereas older individuals usually present with complications of the conduction system of the heart, 
Fetuses will display alterations of Doppler echocardiography on obstetrical ultrasound. Children and teenagers may present with cyanosis and perhaps right heart failure. Manifested as edema, ascites, and exercise intolerance. And adults and the elderly will most likely present with right heart failure and or arrhythmias. Uncommon complications may also be the major finding, such as, for example, paradoxical embolism, demonstrating the presence of the atrial septal defect, which then elicits a further investigation that reveals the tricuspid abnormality. And speaking of investigation, chest radiography will show cardiomegaly because of the large right atrium, and electrocardiography will show Himalayan P waves. Himalayan is just because they are absolutely huge, most likely the largest P waves you will ever see, which makes sense because we are talking about the largest right atrium you will ever see, most likely. And while magnetic resonance imaging of the heart may be useful, the gold standard for diagnosis is Doppler echocardiography. Aside from demonstrating the tricuspid regurgitation, the displacement of the leaflets and the massively dilated right atrium, it's also useful because one of the prognostic factors for Epstein anomaly is the ratio between the size of the right atrium and the size of the rest of the heart. Treatment for Epstein anomaly will include pharmacotherapy for heart failure, as well as antiarrhythmic drugs. Radiofrequency ablation of the accessory pathways is also a procedure likely to be necessary to prevent the occurrence of fatal arrhythmias. And additional procedures may be indicated to close the atrial septal defect, as well as correct associated defects, such as pulmonary stenosis. Naturally, tricuspid valve repair is one of the main staples of the surgical treatment. There are many existing techniques and there is no consensus, although some centers show a preference for the Silva's cone repair technique or cone procedure. Surgically replacing the valve is also possible, and a preference is given to bioprosthetic valves over mechanical valves. Depending on the severity, additional procedures such as the placement of a shunt may be necessary in younger patients. Still, since the mortality for the repair is relatively high, there is an argument for performing surgery only in patients that are symptomatic and or with worsening heart function. This is again compounded by the wide variety in severity of this disease. As of the needs in heart disease, cardiac transplantation is usually the last resort. Thank you for watching this video and for choosing to share your time with me. I hope this has proven useful. If you've liked it, please consider checking my playlist on congenital heart disease, as well as my other playlists on different medical themes. Please bear in mind this is not meant as medical advice, only as a review. If you believe you or someone you know may have Epstein anomaly, please seek your physician. If you believe one of your patients may have Epstein anomaly, please check the latest protocols. Thank you once more for sharing your time with me, and I hope to see you on the next video.